أما بعد. Our history relates to us the story of an extraordinary scholar, one who asked the Muslims of his time an important question, a serious question. So who was this great scholar, and what was that important question? His name was Malik ibn Dinar, rahimahullah. He was originally, they say, from Kabul, from Afghanistan, but he grew up in Basra, in Iraq. And in Basra, he studied with the great scholars of Basra at that time, Al-Hassan al-Basri, Muhammad ibn Sidin, and many others. Until finally, he also became a great scholar, full of knowledge and wisdom. And he was not only a great example in terms of his knowledge, but even in terms of his zuhd, or his asceticism, his <coughs> detachment from the worldly things of this world. Uh, they used to say about him that his house, his door had no lock and no key, because there was nothing in the house, nothing to steal anyway. So, mashallah, the brother didn't have to worry about forgetting his keys, because he didn't have a key or a lock for his door. And he used to make a living copying the Qur'an, so before we had the printing press, before things were digital, you know if you wanted a Qur'an, you go to the scribe, and then he will copy out the Qur'an, a copy for you. So he would take four months to complete a copy of the Qur'an from the beginning to the end, and then he would take his salary, his payment for that, and he would give it to the baqal, to the grocer, and from that he used to uh, pay for his food. And that was how he used to make his living. And he was one of the first Muslims recorded to have entered the subcontinent. So he traveled to the area that we now call the motherland, Pakistan and India. And he was one of the first people to make da'wah to Islam. And even though the exact location of his uh, grave is disputed, it's believed that he passed away in the state of Kerala. So many of us, if not all of us, owe a great debt to Malik ibn Dina, rahimahullah, and the other Muslims like him. The ones who came and taught our ancestors about Islam. <coughs> who showed our ancestors what it means to be a Muslim and through their example guided our ancestors to embrace this religion and pass it on to us. That was the man. So what was his question? Malik ibn Dina rahimahullah he is full of many many wise sayings. But one day he asked the Muslims of his time and this, this question applies for us as well. It's a question that we must answer not only today but every day. He said, Ya Ahl al-Qur'an, O people of the Qur'an, Mada za'a al-Qur'an fi qulubikum? What has the Qur'an planted in your hearts? What seeds has the Qur'an planted in your hearts? And then he said, فَإِنَّ الْقُرْآنَ رَبِيعُ الْمُؤْمِنِ كَمَا أَنَّ الْغَيْثَ رَبِيعُ الْأَرْضِ Because the Qur'an is the springtime of the believer. Just like the rain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends, causes the springtime of the earth. It brings the foliage, the plants, that things start to grow when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down the rain. When we look at our forefathers in this faith, we find that the Quran planted seeds in their hearts. And from these seeds, they were able to harvest, to, get, to develop the most excellent qualities, the highest virtues, the best qualities. The Quran planted these seeds and they were able to reap the greatest change in their character, in their lives, and in the lives of those around them. For amongst the seeds that the Quran planted in our predecessors were the seeds of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they would read the Quran and they would increase in their love for Allah. They would increase in their love for his messenger. They would increase in their love for this religion. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Man sarrahu an yuhibbu Allah wa rasoolah fal yaqraf al mushaf That whoever wants to love Allah and his messenger, meaning whoever wants to increase in his love for Allah and increase in his love for the messenger of Allah, fal yaqraf al mushaf Then read the Qur'an. Read the Qur'an. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ فَمَنْهُ مَنْ يَقُولُ أَيُّكُمْ زَادَتْهُ هَذِهِ إِيمَانًا That when a surah is revealed, the munafiqeen, the ones who are not really believers, they say, which of you has had his faith increased by this? فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَزَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا 
وهم يستبشرون but as for those who believe their faith is increased their love for Allah is increased وهم يستبشرون and then they rejoice and they take delight in learning more about the Quran and having a new surah to, new surah to learn and study and benefit from once the Prophet ﷺ, he sent a military expedition and he put in command of this expedition a certain man. So when they went out on this expedition, this Amir, this leader, when he would lead the group, the platoon in the prayer, he would recite Al-Fatiha and then he would recite another surah and then after that he would recite Qul Hu Allahu Ahad. So he would recite Al-Fatiha, then one surah and then after that Qul Hu Allahu Ahad in every raka'ah. So, when they returned back to Al Medina, his companion, they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they mentioned this to him. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Saluhu. Saluhu li ayyi shaytan. Yes, na'udalik. Ask him why he does this. Why does he keep reciting Al Ikhlas, Surah Al Ikhlas, in every raka'ah? So they asked him. So he said, Li annaha sifatul rahman. Because it has, it contains the qualities of Al Rahman. It mentions the attributes of Allah, of Ar-Rahman. And I love to recite it in my prayer. To remember Allah's attributes. To remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard this response, he said, Inform him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him. Because he loves to recite the Quran. He loves to increase in his love for Allah. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has increased in his love for him. Once one of the righteous scholars, he asked his student, Atahfad al-Quran, do, do you memorize the Quran? The student said, no. So the scholar was amazed. He said, Ya lillahi li buridin, la yahfad al-Quran. My God, oh my Lord, a person who seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't memorize the Quran. Fabima yatana'am. Then with, with, with what? Do you enjoy yourself? With what do you rejoice? What do you use to make yourself feel better and take delight if it's not the Quran? And what do you use to speak to your Lord? To converse with your master, subhanahu wa ta'ala. From amongst the seeds that the Quran planted in the hearts of our ancestors are the seeds of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That not only did the Quran increase them in love for Allah, but it also increased them in awe of Allah and fear of His punishment. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَخِرُّونَ لِلْأَذْقَانِ يَبَكُونَ وَيَزِيدُهُمْ خُشُوعًا That the Quran increases the believers in khushu'a, in fear, in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only do their hearts tremble when they hear the Quran, but the believers are those whose physical bodies, their ears are also affected, their eyes are affected, and even their skin is affected by the reciting of the Quran. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah nazzala ahsan al-hadith, that Allah has revealed us the best speech, kitab mutashabiha mathani, a book that one part resembles the other, meaning that these stories are similar to one another, the laws are similar to one another, that the book is consistent, from the beginning to the end. تَقْشَعِرُّ مِنْهُ جُلُودُ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ The skin of those who fear their Lord makes اِقْتِشَعَ You know, sometimes when it's cold, your hair stand on end. Or you get scared, your hair stand on end. We call it in English, you get goosebumps. You call it, I guess, in English, yeah? In America, we say, you get goosebumps. The hair stand on end. So this in Arabic is تَقْشَعِرْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that the skin of those who fear their Lord, they get goosebumps from hearing the Quran. And then their skin, their skin and their hearts grow soft to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The companions of the Prophet وسلم, and the Muslims after them, when they would read the verses of the Quran, and they would hear the warnings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the Quran. They were not like many of us. They, they did not think that these warnings are for somebody else. The warnings don't apply to me, this is for the other person. No, they would take these warnings and
and treat them seriously. And they were afraid that these warnings were applying to them first and foremost. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was well known when he was a Khalifa that he would, he took a very serious attitude towards enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. And he used to have a small stick, and he's not a big one, it has a small, more like a small whip, called a durra. And he would use a durra to go teach the people in his own unique way. So for example, once he was coming out of the masjid and he saw Ubay ibn Ka'b. Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu, he was one of the greatest reciters of the Quran. And the Prophet <coughs> told Ubay that he told him once to uh, recite the Quran to him. And Ubay said, Shall I recite to you when you are the one upon whom the Quran was revealed? So Allah, so the Prophet he said, Allah has commanded me that to ask you to recite the Quran. So Ubay ibn Ka'b started to weep. And he said, Asamani Rabbi, that Allah speak my name. That Allah speak my name. So Ubay ibn Ka'b is one of the greatest scholars of the Quran and one of the, the greatest reciters of the Quran. And the people in his time, they knew this. So Ubay ibn Ka'b was once coming out of the masjid and he had a crowd of people around him. Many of the people who are his students and others. And this is sometimes the same phenomenon we see around others. Because Yani, at that time, he is like a celebrity. They want to come and they want to learn from him. Here, ask their questions. Hear the answers. So they were crowding around him. So Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he wants to prevent the fitna. He wants to prevent any trouble before it starts. So he took a durra and he came and he started hitting the people, dispersing the crowd. And then he started hitting Ubay ibn Ka'b. And he said, هذا fitna للمتبوع مذلة للتابع This is a fitna for the one who is followed. Meaning it is fitna for you. It may change your, make you change your intention. Make you start showing off that you think you have this crowd behind you. This is humiliation for them that they follow around behind you like this. So he dispersed the crowd with a durra. Likewise, there was one slaughterhouse in Al Medina. So at times, Umar al Khattab he would monitor the slaughterhouse. And if he saw anyone coming to the slaughterhouse, yeah, he would buy the meat. And they came to buy meat two days in a row. Again, he would take a durra and he would go and hit the person. And he would say, why do you not keep your belly empty for your neighbor, for your cousin? In other words, one day you buy the people are saying, how many hadith Abu Huraira narrates? How many hadiths? Why, why does he narrate so many hadith? So he said, And if it wasn't for one verse in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I would have not narrated, I would not have narrated even one hadith. If it wasn't for one verse in the Quran, I wouldn't have narrated any of these hadith. What was the verse? The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ الْبَيَّنَاتِ وَالْهُدَى مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا بَيَّنَّاهُ لِلنَّاسِ أُولَٰئِكَ لِيَلْعَنُهُمْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنُهُمْ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنُهُمْ اللَّعِنُونَ As for those who conceal what we have revealed from the right guidance, from the proofs and the guidance, after we have made, we have made it clear to the people, they are the ones that Allah has cursed and the others who curse, they curse them as well. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was so afraid that this knowledge that he had learned from the Prophet sallallahu that he would be held accountable, that this verse would apply to him if he didn't go out and spread it. And so this is why he changed the course of his life and he dedicated his life to teaching the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa out of fear of this verse. Imam Malik rahimahullah, generations after Umar al Abu Huraira. Imam Malik, as, as is well known, he was the founder of his own school of fiqh, his own school of thought. And in that madhab, they viewed the prayer. You know, when you come in the masjid, the Prophet وسلم, said that a person should pray two raka'at before sitting down to honor the masjid, out of respect for the masjid. This is called tahiyyat al masjid. So, there are also other hadith that indicate that at certain times someone is not supposed to pray. For example, after Fajr prayer and after Asr prayer and so on. So, what's the right thing to do? According to Imam Malik, in his school of thought, if somebody comes into the masjid, for example, after Salat al Asr, then they shouldn't pray to Hayat al Masjid. Yani this is the, an exception to the rule, and instead they should just sit down. This was his madhab. Anyway, one day he came into Masjid al Nabawi, he came into the masjid, and he sat down. It was after Asr, so he sat down, as is his mother. 
So there was a young boy who was sitting there, and he didn't know who this man was. So he said, Ya Sheikh, Qum, Warqa'ah, stand up and pray two rak'ahs. And he says, don't you know at your age, don't you know you're supposed to pray two rak'ahs, Tahayyid al-Masjid? So Imam Malik stood up, and he prayed two rak'ahs. And then he gave the taslim. So after he finished the prayer, the whole masjid gathered around Imam Malik. Everyone got up and came and said, have you changed your madhab? Have you changed your madhab? What's happened? Didn't you say you're not supposed to pray to Haytham Masjid after Salat al-Asr? So Imam Malik, he said, I've not changed my madhab. But this boy told me to stand up and pray. And I was afraid that if I did not pray, that I would be included amongst those mentioned in the verse when Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ هُرْكَعُوا لَا يَرْكَعُونَ And when it's said to them to bow down, to pray, they don't bow down. So out of fear that he would be included in this verse, he stood up and he prayed the two rak'ahs. From amongst the seeds that the Quran planted in the hearts of our ancestors, our forefathers, were the seeds of wisdom. That the Quran increased the believers in wisdom and insight. And how can this not be the case when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has himself described this book as being a wise book, a book full of wisdom. As he says, Yaseen, wal Quran al Hakim. Yaseen, the book, the Quran that is wise, the wise Quran. This Quran is full of wisdom, full of insight. But it must be approached in the right way. It must be studied in the right way. Because if someone does not approach the Quran in the correct way, then rather than getting insight, rather than getting wisdom, they can be led astray. Someone who doesn't, does not refer back to the understanding of the Quran, of our Prophet وسلم, and his students, the Sahaba, not only will he not find wisdom, but he may actually go astray and get the complete wrong understanding of the verse. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Ya ayyu al-ladheena amanu, alaykum anfusakum, O you who believe, upon you are your own souls. La yadurrukum man dalla idha tadaytum. The one who goes astray, he will not harm you if you are rightly guided. Someone may come and take this verse and say, well, if this is the case, this means that I only have to worry about myself. That as long as I'm praying and I'm Doing, my, doing what Allah has commanded me. If there are other Muslims who are doing wrong things, doing haram things, well, it's not my business. I'm not here to uh, be my brother's keeper, to command the good and forbid the evil. Because Allah is saying, as long as I'm doing the right thing, then if somebody else is doing wrong action, then that's not going to harm me. So in other words, this verse means we don't have to command the good and forbid the evil. And this was the understanding even of some people in the time of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. So once Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu stood up on the minbar and he praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he recited this verse and he said, Ya ayyuhal nas, innakum latatluna ayatam min kitab Allah wa ta'abdunaha ruhsa. O people, you recite a verse from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you take it as a ruhsa, as a license, meaning that it is now permitted for you not to forbid for, uh, command the good and forbid the evil. And you just mind your own business and you ignore people if they are committing sins. So he corrected the people. In another narration he said, You recite a book of Allah and you don't understand a verse from the book of Allah and you don't understand what it means. Now we know from other ayat, other verses, another hadith, that it's an obligation on Muslims to command the good and forbid the evil. If you see someone doing something haram, then it's obligatory on us to command the good, to tell that person to stop doing this sin and so forth. As the Prophet he said, whoever of you sees an evil deed, then let him change it with his hand. If you cannot do that, then change it with his tongue. And if you cannot do that, then at least you should hate it in your heart. But there is something in this verse itself that proves that this understanding is wrong. And in the verse, Allah says, O you who believe upon you are your own souls. The one who goes astray will not harm you if you are rightly guided. In this verse, is a proof that commanding the good and forbidding the evil is obligatory. What is it? <laughs> you have to speak up. <laughs> Say it again. 
What's, what is in the verse that shows that when someone says, if someone said, this verse means if somebody is drinking alcohol and doing haram things, I should mind my own business and if he wants to do something wrong, it's not my concern. It won't harm me. Because Allah says, upon you are your own souls. Just look out to yourself. You understand? This understanding is wrong. There's something in the verse that shows that this understanding is wrong. So it is the plural, but not at the end, at the beginning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't say, O Muslim, upon you is your own soul. He says, O Muslims, O you who believe, upon you are your own souls. Meaning, upon you is your soul and everybody else's soul. Meaning, you are responsible for all of each other. You have to look after one another. You have to work to make sure that all of you are safe from the hellfire, not just your own soul. So Allah says, O you who believe, alaykum and fusakum, upon you is each one of your own souls. You are responsible for your brother. You are responsible for your sister. You are required to do everything you can to rescue them from the hellfire, just like you want to rescue yourself. So if we command the good and we forbid the evil, we do our best to save our brothers and our sisters. If they don't listen, then what? Allah says, لا يضركم من ضل إذا اهتديتم as long as you were guided to command the good and forbid the evil, as long as you did your bit, if they don't listen, then that's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The result now is with Allah whether He wants to show mercy to them or punish them. So this verse is actually not a license to not do, not to command the good or forbid the evil, but in fact it is enforcement. It is obliging and making obligatory to command the good and forbid the evil. And this is what Abu Bakr told the people. He said, you think it is a ruhsa? Wallahi ma anzal Allahu fi kitabihi ashadda minha. Wallahi Allah has not revealed a verse more strict in commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Making it more obligatory than this verse. Because he's saying, upon you is each one of your own souls. And then he said, Wallahi la ta'muranna bil ma'aruf, wa la tanhawunna anil munkari, wa la ya'amman, la ya'ammannakum Allahu minhu bi'iqab. You must command the good and you must forbid evil, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cover all of you with his punishment. So the Quran is full of wisdom. But we must look to our predecessors, to the Prophet and to the Sahaba, to unlock this wisdom. Otherwise, we may run the risk of taking the wrong understanding from the Quran. <coughs> from amongst the seeds that the Quran planted in the hearts of our ancestors were the seeds of Tawbah, the seeds of repentance, the seeds of seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the tabi'in, Qatada rahimahullah, he said, Inna al-Qur'an yadullukum ala da'ikum wa dawa'ikum. That this Qur'an, verily, it guides you to your sickness and also to the cure. The Qur'an gives us the information about our sickness and it also gives us the cure. Fa'amma da'ukum fadunubukum. As for your sickness, it is your sins. Wa'amma dawa'ukum fadistighfar. And as for its cure, then it is asking Allah's forgiveness, repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once in the time of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, it was reported to him that there was a great mujahid in Asham, who was uh, a great warrior, a terrific warrior on the battlefield. But this man, he had a weakness, like many of us, and his weakness was alcohol. And no matter what he would do to try to break the habit, he would fall again and again and fall back into the old habit of drinking. So Umar Khattab, when he heard this, he called for his scribe. And then he dictated the letter. And in the letter he said, write down, من عمر بن الخطاب إلى فلان. سلام عليك. From Umar Khattab to so and so. Peace be upon you. وأنا أحمد الله إليك الذي لا إله إلا هو. So I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. The one whom there is no one worthy of worship except him. And then he put down some verses from the Quran. The first few verses of Surah Ghafir. So he told the scribe, write down. Hamim, Tanzeenul Kitabi min Allahil Aziz Alim, 
غافر الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب ذي الطول لا إله إلا هو إليه المصير حاميم This is a book revealed from Al-Aziz Al-Alim The Almighty, The All-Powerful, The All-Knowing غافر الذنب The one who forgives sin قابل التوب The one who accepts repentance شديد العقاب The one who is severe in punishment The toll The one who has abundance لا إله إلا هو There is no one worthy of worship except him إليه المصير And to him is the return The final destination والسلام عليكم And that was the end of the letter يعني only the introduction and then these verses of the Quran Then he sent the messenger and he said Give this letter to him And make sure you give it to him when he's sober Make sure you wait until he's sober Then you give him the letter and then when the messenger left, he told the people around him, raise your hands and make dua for our brother. Raise your hands and make dua for him. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides him to Tawbah. So when the letter reached Asham, and this mujahid now opened the letter, and he heard and he read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, my Lord has promised to me that he forgives sin. My Lord has told me that he accepts repentance. My Lord is telling me that he is severe in punishment. And he kept on repeating these words and reciting the Quran and, and he started to weep. Until finally he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he committed to himself that he would never ever return back to alcohol again. So then when the news reached Umar al-Khattab, when the governor of Shem sent back a letter saying, this mujahid has now kicked the habit. He is now free of this sin, free of alcohol. Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he read the letter and then he told the people around him, هَكَذَا فَاسْنَعُوا Behave like this. Behave like this. إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ أَحَدَكُمْ زَلَّ If you see one of you slip, you see one of your brothers fall into sin, فَصَدِّدُوهُ Then straighten him up. Help him get back on his feet. Don't condemn him, don't judge him. Allah has not sent us to be judges over our brothers. But if you see someone make a mistake, Help him get back up. Help him get back on the straight path. And don't be helpless of shaitan upon him. Meaning you start looking down your nose at him. You judge him. You are arrogant with him. So that he flees and he stays away. And he goes further into sin. Many of us, we lack this forgiveness. This forgiveness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised his slaves in the Quran. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim, la taqnatu min rahmatillah. O my slaves who have transgressed, who have gone to excess in sinning, don't despair of the mercy of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing a certain group of people. Who are these people? The sinners. The ones who disobey Him by day and by night. And how does He call them? How does He address them? He says, Ya ibadi, O my slaves. He still keeps his connection with them. Even though they are disobeying, disobeying him. Even though they're not praying. Even though they're far away from him. He is still keeping his tie with them. You are still my slaves. I haven't cut off from you. Don't despair of my mercy. So it's not right for us that when we see one of our brothers, when we see a family member falling into sin, falling into bad habits, that we make them despair of Allah's mercy. Instead of trying to give them support and help them, Keep them firm on the straight path. <coughs> and no one should think that because of the sins they've committed in the past, that because of the evil they've done, no matter how great the evil may be, that they cannot be different people. That the Quran cannot change them or transform them. Because it has been the power of the Quran throughout history to change people and transform them. So in Central Asia, centuries ago, there was a highway robber named al fudayl ibn Iyad. al fudayl ibn Iyad, he used to rob the caravans, raid the caravans that were traveling in the desert. You know, in the old days, there were no police, you know, there were no armies. When you travel in the desert, you travel at your own peril, at your own risk. So al fudayl ibn Iyad, he used to go and he used to rob the caravans. And he was such a skilled thief that rather than having a gang to help him, he was good enough, skilled enough that he could rob the caravans single-handedly. And he was so good with his sword, so good at robbing, he didn't need any assistance. But he was what we call in English a gentleman thief. And a when he would 
find the people he would break the caravan, he would not harm the people, he would not kill them. And if he found that the people were needy or poor, then he would leave them their money, he would not take their money or rob them. But nevertheless, he was a criminal, and he used to operate in this way throughout Central Asia. And he became famous on the roads going back and forth from Samarkand. So one night in Samarkand, al fadl bin Yad, he was climbing a wall, going to this woman's house to go to something haram. And as he was climbing the wall and scaling it, one of the neighbors was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reciting the Qur'an. And he heard the words of the reciter when he said, أَلَمْ يَعْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكِرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ That has the time not come. Has the time not come for the hearts of those who believe to be softened to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what Allah has revealed from the truth. Is it not time for the hearts to be softened to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed? So Fadil ibn Iyad, he started to weep and he said, Bala ya Rabb. Yes, my Lord, the time has come. Enough is enough. The time has come for me to change my ways. So then he started climbing down the wall. And as he was walking back, he passed a group of travelers who were <coughs> camping, stopping to rest. You know, the only they would travel at night, and then they would rest during the day because of the heat. So this group was, this caravan was resting. And then one of them said, let us return back on the road. Let us continue our journey, because we have a long way to go. But one of the others said, no, Al-Fudayl is still out there on the road. Al-Fudayl is still there out there on the road. So let us wait a while longer until the night is darker, when Al-Fudayl is asleep, and then we will continue our journey. So Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, he said, a group of the work servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are afraid to continue their journey because of me. A group of Muslims is unable to journey to continue their travel because of me. Allahumma inni tubtu ilayk, O Allah, I turn the repentance to you, and I make my repentance to you, O Allah, that I will spend the rest of my life living next to your house in Mecca. So al Fadil ibn Iyad, from that second, he left off the life of crime. And he made his way to Mecca. And on the way, he stopped at the major cities of the Muslim world. And he studied with the great scholars of his time. And he memorized the Quran, and he memorized the Hadith, until he himself became a scholar. And then finally he arrived in Mecca, and he spent the rest of his life worshipping Allah and <coughs> teaching at the Kaaba. From amongst the seeds that the Quran has planted in our ancestors are the seeds of courage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed the Quran to develop and increase the believers in courage through his words. We know that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was a khalifa, he began a campaign against both the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and the Persian Empire, simultaneously. And Khalid bin Walid was initially successful in attacking and invading the Persian Empire. And he was so successful that the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire, these two empires, who were the, what they call the superpowers of their age, they both made an alliance. They had spent centuries fighting one another. Now they both made an alliance to fight against the Muslims. They said, خلاص, yani, against one on one we cannot defeat these people. Let us work together to defeat these people. Because we fight for the basis of empire. These people fight for the basis of their faith. And Heraclius, the emperor of Rome, or the emperor of Byzantine, he married his daughter to the uh, emperor of Persia. He has the gift to seal the alliance. So now when Umar al-Khattab was the Khalifa, he continued the campaign, campaign against this united alliance between the Romans and the Persians. And he sent his great general Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas to lead the campaign against the Persians. And one of the great battles that occurred against the Persian Empire was at a place called Al-Qadisiyah. The Battle of Al-Qadisiyah. This battle lasted for a few days until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Muslims victory. They were a force of 30,000 facing an enemy of nearly 100,000. And they were outnumbered two to one. But on the first day, before the battle began, Sa'id ibn Abi Qas, he ordered one of the Qurra, one of the Qaris, and the people who are ordered to, who lead the, the Mujahideen in the prayer. He ordered this man to go and recite Surah Al Anfal, the Surah they call Surah Al Jihad. Recite Surah Al Anfal upon the platoon 
So he went to the first platoon and he recited Surah Al-Anfal. And then when he finished with them, he went to the next one and the next one. So he recited the Surah from every platoon. So one of the historians, he said, فَحَشَتْ قُلُوبُ النَّاسِ وَعَرِفُوا السَّكِينَةَ مَعَ قِرَاءَتِهَا So the spirits of the heart of the people, of the believers, was raised. They found the courage to meet their enemy. They found the courage to face those overwhelming odds by hearing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sakina, the tranquility descended upon them مَعَ with its reciting. The more they heard the Qur'an, the more they felt peace facing this enemy that was outnumbering them and overpowering them. <coughs> and likewise, the Muslims were able to find the courage they needed when they faced the greatest calamity that this Muslim Ummah has ever faced. In the darkest day that the Muslims have ever seen, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were able to find the courage they needed in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on the 29th of Safar, in the 11th year after the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ began, became afflicted with a fever. And very quickly this fever became worse until the point that the Prophet ﷺ was not able to stand. And he would spend his time lying down, reclining on his mattress. And to keep the fever down, they would take uh, water skins, you know, back then they didn't have the jugs, they just had the skin, the animal skins filled with water. They would take the skins of water and they would pour the cold water over him, one after the other, until seven water skins would be poured over him, of cold water, to keep his fever down. But still his fever, his fever would shoot up. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he said that once I came and I put my hand on the arm of the Prophet وسلم, and I felt his skin. And I felt how high the fever was, how hot his skin was. And I said, Ya Rasulullah, such a high fever. So the Prophet he said, yes, the fever that I have been afflicted with is double the fever that others are afflicted with. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, Ya Rasulullah, is that because you will have a double reward? So the Prophet وسلم, he said, yes, that the ones who are tested the hardest in this life are the Anbiya, then the ones who are most righteous after them, and then the Muslims were most righteous after them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inflict, uh, afflicted the Prophet with the highest fever because this was to raise his status by showing sabr and enduring this high fever. And when the Prophet after 11 days of leading the people in the prayer with his fever, when he was no longer able to stand, he then asked Abu Bakr to lead the people in the prayer. <coughs> And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would let the people in the prayer. Until finally, only two or three days before the end, the Prophet was in his home. And Fatima came to visit her father. So the Prophet now he was weak. He was not able to speak loudly. So he called Fatima to come close. So she came close to her father. And so he whispered something to her. And she started to weep. And then he whispered something again. And she started to laugh. <coughs> so afterwards, Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked Fatima, what was it that the Prophet said to you? So Fatima, she said, he told me first that he would not recover from this illness. So I started to weep because I know that this would be the end. And then he mentioned to me that I will be the first of his family to join him. So I started to laugh. And then Musab ibn Zayd, the son of the adopted son of the Prophet, وسلم, Zayd ibn Haritha, he came to visit the Prophet. And the Prophet وسلم, had now by now lost the power of speech. So he would put his hand on Musab ibn Zayd, and then he would raise it, and then put it down on him again, and then raise it. So Aisha, she said, we knew that he was making dua for him. We could tell that he was making dua for. Musab ibn Zayd, this one that he loved so much just as he loved his father Zayd ibn Haritha. Until finally, when the Prophet could no, longer, could no longer speak, he was in the arms of his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. And he looked to the heavens 
And he said, Bal al Rafiq al A'la, Bal al Rafiq al A'la, Bal al Rafiq al A'la. And later on, Aisha radiallahu anha, she would narrate these words of the Prophet. <coughs> and the Sahaba knew what was happening because the Prophet he told the Sahaba that as an honor to the Anbiya, when Allah sends the angel of death, for, for us, when the angel of death comes, we don't get any time to argue. We simply have to go. We have to leave. Time is up. But as an honor to the Anbiya, the angel of death asked permission from the Prophet to take his soul. He asked permission and says, do you mind? You, are you ready to now leave this world? So when the Prophet was given this choice to continue longer in this world or to join his greatest companion, the one he loves more than anyone, the Prophet indicated his choice. Know the highest companion. Know to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, I choose to I choose to be with Allah. And then he passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After that, the news spread through Medina. And Sahaba were in shock. Some of them they didn't know how to react. Some were dumbfounded. Others they hid in their homes, hiding from the people because they didn't know what to say when they would face the people. Others were weeping. Others, like Umar Khattab, could not believe the news. Umar Khattab radiallahu anhu went to the Muslim and he took out his sword and he said, Anyone who says that Muhammad is dead, I will chop his head off for being a munafiq. Wallahi, he is not dead. Wallahi, he has gone to be with his Lord and he will return, just like Musa went to his Lord and he returned. And he will punish those who spread these foul rumors that he has passed away. So the news started to spread, the rumors spread until finally they reached Abu Bakr, who was outside of Medina at this time. So immediately Abu Bakr rushed back to Medina. And when he came into Medina, he went straight to the house of Aisha, straight to the Prophet And he found when he went inside that the women were crying. And they found, he found the body and it was covered up by a sheet. So he had covered the face of the Prophet and he kissed him on his forehead. And he said, you are pure in death as you were pure in life. You have died the death that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you. And you will not die a second time. And then he went out to address the people. So when he went out, he told Umar Khattab, sit down. But Umar Khattab was too inflamed, his passion was too aroused. So he would not listen. So then Abu Bakr went away from him. And the people left Umar and they crowded around Abu Bakr. And then he said his famous speech. He said, Amma ba'ad, faman kana minkum ya'abudu Muhammadan, fa'inna Muhammadan qad mat. Whoever amongst you worships Muhammad, then know that Muhammad is dead. وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتُ And as for those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is ever living and He will never die. And then what did Abu Bakr say? What words could he share what, that would help the Sahaba to endure this dark day, this great calamity, the greatest calamity that the Muslims had ever seen, that their Prophet is now gone, their leader has now passed, that the revelation that used to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of it had ceased. He turned them back to the Qur'an. Back to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Qur'an will be the source of their courage. Just as it was their source of courage on the battlefield. So he reminded them of the verse in Surah Ali Imran. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلٌ And Muhammad is no more than a messenger. And many were the messengers who passed away before him. So if he dies, or he is killed, will you then turn back on your heels? Will you go back to idolatry? And whoever goes back on his heels, he doesn't harm Allah in the least. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward those who are grateful. So when he recited these words, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he said, والله لك أن الناس لم يعلموا أن الله أنزل هذه الآية حتى تلاها أبو بكر. والله it was as if the people didn't know that Allah had recited had revealed this verse already. It was as if they had forgotten it until Abu Bakr reminded them of it when he recited it. فتلقاها منه الناس كلهم. So then all of the people started reciting this verse, reminding themselves of this verse, 
inspiring in themselves the courage they need to sustain this calamity. فَمَا أَسْمَعُوا بَشْرَ مِنَ النَّاسِ إِلَّا يَتْلُوهَا So I did not hear any man in that masjid except that he was reciting this verse, finding the comfort he needed, the courage he needed in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The question of Malik ibn Dinar is one that should be in front of us today and every day. It is a question of a lifetime. ماذا زرع القرآن في قلوبكم? What has the Quran planted in our hearts? What have we harvest, harvested in our hearts from the Quran? Have we increased in the fear of Allah, in the love of Allah, in courage, in nobility, in all of the virtues that are available to us through the Quran? Or have we turned a blind eye and we are like the soil upon which nothing grows? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْبَلَدُ الطَّيِّبُ يَخْرُجُ نَبَاتُهُ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِ وَالَّذِي خَبُثُ لَا يَخْرُجُ إِلَّا نَكِدًا And as for the good soil, the good land, its vegetation emerges with the permission of Allah. And as for the impure soil, nothing comes from it, nothing grows from it, except scarce and sparse. كَذَلِكِ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمِ يَشْكُرُونَ And in this way we explain the verses, we explain the signs to a people who show gratitude. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to soften our hearts with the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help plant in our hearts the seeds of virtue and greatness and so that we are able to harvest that great harvest from the Qur'an. Ameen wa akhir wa da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.